Hi, and thanks for watching this short video where I'm going to give some basic justification for QA. My name's Nick Dudley, and I'm a physicist, and I've been working in ultrasound for over 40 years, almost half of that time with a clinical role. I've always had an interest in quality assurance, both of the equipment and the imaging process. Now, lots of people have told me we don't need QA in ultrasound because there isn't any legislation and because clinical users can detect faults while they're scanning. Well, neither of these are true. But before I tell you why, my first argument for QA is that we're trying to protect the patient from misdiagnosis. The patient has a right to know that we're using equipment that's fit for purpose. Can you reassure the patient that your equipment is working properly? If you can, that means you're probably doing some checks, which is great. If you can't, that means that either nobody's doing any checks or you know the equipment's not working properly, but you're going to use it anyway. Now, coming back to legislation, in the UK, we have generic legislation like the Health and Social Care Act that require us to keep our equipment in good working order and fit for purpose. That means that we have to do some sort of QA on it if we're going to make sure that it has no more than minor deterioration. Now this legislation is driven by the EU, so it's quite likely that other European countries have similar legislation. Also, in a few countries, including the UK and the USA, we have accreditation schemes that make QA mandatory. Detecting faults during clinical scanning can be quite difficult. When you're scanning, you're in a darkened room, so you're not really able to look at the equipment, so you're probably not going to detect any equipment faults. The advanced processing on modern scanners can mask faults. If you look at this first image, on clinical settings, everything looks okay. But on this second image, where I've changed to the user QA settings, you can see there are five lines of dropout. So here, it's clear that the advanced processing has masked this fault. Another argument against QA is cost and resources. How long does it take to have a look at your equipment and check the uniformity before you use the equipment in the morning? Probably no more than about five minutes. But what's the cost of a misdiagnosis for the patient? That can be disastrous for the patient and potentially result in litigation. To summarise, QA is mandatory in legislation and in accreditation schemes. It's done to protect the patient from misdiagnosis and us from litigation, and it's quite difficult to detect faults in clinical use. It may seem like a huge project to implement QA, but actually you can do it in several easy steps and get some returns at each stage. First of all, have a look at what you're doing already. You probably have a maintenance contract. You're looking after your probes and stowing the probes and cables carefully, and you're keeping the equipment clean. If you look in the literature, over 90% of faults are detected by physical inspection and a uniformity assessment. So if you add a periodic check of the condition of the equipment, and the in-air reverberation uniformity, you're going to detect the majority of significant faults. Then add in some simple sensitivity tests, fault management and audit, and you're running an effective QA program. Now there are some more advanced tests that do have value. It's possible that clinical staff could do them themselves, but this might be an area where some help from an in-house or external physics or engineering service could be some support. If you watch the other short videos, you'll see how simple QA can actually be. Good luck.